Okay, are we all, can you hear me? That sounds pretty good. Not bad. Okay. So we have a lot of heavy duty questions and things to ponder tonight. So I thought maybe we would start with something a little um, lighter and <laughs> more personal. There's a really wonderful essay toward the beginning of this book, Science in the Soul. I have a um, bound galleys, which gives me complete license to write all over these pages, which you won't want to do with your copy of the book. But there's I'd like to read what you've written. <laughs> Some of it is fascinating. <laughs> so I wonder, um, Dr. Dawkins, you have this wonderful essay about being influenced by Charles Darwin and by Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> How many of you have read the Hugh Fleming book, Dr. Doolittle, or, or seen the film with Rex Harrison? Oh, so you all know. You, you pretty much know. That's pretty good. Well, I do think there's some similarity between Dr. Doolittle and at least the young Darwin. I mean, they're roughly contemporary. And Dr. Doolittle was always sort of sailing in little ships, rather like the Beagle. And he was a great naturalist like Charles Darwin. And uh, they both love animals. And I think I was genuinely influenced by Dr. Doolittle. I read all the books, I think. I've never seen any of the films, thank goodness. I, I, <laughs> the Rex Harrison is uh, pretty good. Are they? Yeah, well, that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I always think that if you really love a book, seeing a film spoils it. But, but anyway, I, I, I love Dr. Doolittle, and I think he, he did influence me. Um, I think he influenced me to value non-human animals in a way that I might not otherwise have done. Um, he's actually censored in quite a lot of libraries. He's not allowed in public libraries because of racism. And that was just a symptom of the 1920s, which is when Hugh Lofting wrote the books. I mean, every, everybody in Britain was racist at the time. And, um, but in a very gentle kind of way. But I think that, he, he, that Dr. Doolittle more, more than makes up for it by his anti-speciesism. Well, it, it, Dr. Doolittle, as you point out in the essay, he, he gets into fixes over and over again in which he is helped out of them by, by other animals who, who figure things out, what he needs, and sort of form webs of, of rescue for him. Yes, yeah, so he can, he can talk to, to non-human animals, and that's really the plot of all the, all the stories. I mean, everything turns on this one trick that he has. It's rather like good science fiction, where you just alter one thing. And, and then everything else follows from that. Well, it, it struck me reading it. This, in the last couple of years, we've had a, quite a number of best-selling books, and some of them very good. For example, uh, a book called Beyond Words by Carl Safina, who is a wonderful marine biologist. A book called The Soul of the Octopus by Cy Montgomery, who's a wonderful uh, science writer. And, and they're focused on animal consciousness. And as Carl Safina says, you know, animals... Uh, care about their own life. They want to increase their own life and they care about it furthering their own life just the way you and I do. And um, of course, there's, a, there's kind of a plea at the center of these books for us to understand that we can't just be wiping these creatures off the face of the earth. And what I like about the Dr. Doolittle analogy or, or um, connection is is that he is helped and aided by these animals in ways that we are also aided by animals really without our understanding how we are connected to them quite consciously all the time. Yes, I think it's a bit of a stretch to, 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 to link it in quite that way. And it, it is a children's book. And That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> you're, so, you're so right, actually. Um, another, of, uh, another of the early in the book um, concepts, I mean, your, your writing is so accessible and it's just charming and easy to read, but then you have some you know, real concepts that really make you sit down and think about them pretty hard. And one of them um, I have just been really pondering a lot is, is your, your discussion of how humans and how this moment in time our organisms are adapted perfectly because of this process of natural selection, which is law-like and has been selecting genes over eons to, to br bring the next generation uh, forth, is, is perfectly well adapted to the past, but not to the present or to the future. 
And that along with that, um, when we have these aggregates of lots of successful humans, as we have now, we have these what you call emergent, I don't know if we're going to call them qualities or things that are we create together, such as something like the Internet which then again is a little bit beyond our own capacity to, to deal with um, perfectly well. We're always going to be a little bit misaligned with our own present. Um, this idea of, of time, I think, and our placement in it is very beautifully um, framed by the beginning opening of your book. And I oh, wonder if okay. you would read from that. Um, yes. So this is the introduction which I wrote specially for this book. Much of the rest of the book is previously published essays, although many of them not previously published in this country. This is the introduction. I am writing this two days after a breathtaking visit to Arizona's Grand Canyon. Breathtaking still hasn't gone the way of awesome, although I fear it may. To many Native American tribes, the Grand Canyon is a sacred place, site of numerous origin myths from the Havasupai to the Zuni, hushed repose of the Hopi dead. If I were forced to choose a religion, that's the kind of religion I could go for. The Grand Canyon confers stature on a religion, outclassing the petty smallness of the Abrahamics, the three squabbling cults which, through historical accident, still afflict the world. In the dark night, I walked out along the south rim of the canyon, lay down on a low wall and gazed up at the Milky Way. I was looking back in time, witnessing a scene from a hundred thousand years ago, for that is when the light set out on its long quest to dive through my pupils and spark my retinas. At dawn the following morning, I returned to the spot, shuddered with vertigo as I realized where I had been lying in the dark, <laughs> and looked down towards the canyon's floor. Again, I was gazing into the past, two billion years in this case, back to a time when only microbes stirred sightless beneath the Milky Way. If Hopi souls were sleeping in that majestic hush, they were joined by the rock-bound ghosts of trilobites and crinoids, brachiopods and belemnites, ammonites, even dinosaurs. Was there some point in the mile-long evolutionary progression up the canyon strata when something you could call a soul sprang into existence, like a light suddenly switched on? Or did the soul creep stealthily into the world, a dim thousandth of a soul in a pulsating tube worm? A tenth of a soul in a coelacanth, half a soul in a tarsier, then a typical human soul, eventually a soul on the scale of a Beethoven or a Mandela. Or is it just silly to speak of souls at all? Not silly if you mean something like an overwhelming sense of subjective personal identity. Each one of us knows we possess it, even if, as many modern thinkers aver, it is an illusion. An illusion constructed, as Darwinians might speculate, because a coherent agency of singular purpose helps us to survive. So I'll tell you what I wrote in my book upon reading those, those paragraphs. Is Richard Dawkins getting spiritual on us? <laughs> well, that's part of the point. I mean, <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's kind of meant to be a little bit provocative to put the word soul in the, in the title. Um, I, I said last night that um, I, I, I quoted one of my great heroes, Peter Medower, great um, medical scientist and biologist and Nobel Prize winner. He said, um, I hope I shall not be... He was giving a lecture and he said... I hope I shall not be thought ungracious if I say at the outset that nothing on earth would have induced me to attend the kind of lecture you may think I'm about to give. <laughs> and I then said, I hope I may not be thought, I hope I shall not be thought ungracious if I say at the outset that if you have come hoping from the word soul to witness some kind of conversion, you're going to be <laughs> disappointed. Um, 
I, there, there are two meanings of the word soul, and it's in, somewhere in the book I, I quote two dic- dictionary definitions, definitions from the Oxford Dictionary. Uh, one of which is the immortal soul, the religious soul, the supernatural soul, the one that survives your death. And that's not what I'm talking about. And the other is the sort of spiritual, aesthetic, emotional response to science, to the universe, to life, to deep time, deep space, that kind of thing. That's the sense of soul in which I use it in the title. I wonder if you could, uh, if you could elaborate a little on this emergent concept. Yes, well, you were saying earlier about how, it's a very interesting point you were making, about how um, we are adapted to the past, all animals are adapted to the past, uh, the, the genes that made us are genes that have survived through countless generations. You look back on your ancestors and every single one of your ancestors, not a single one of your ancestors died before achieving at least one heterosexual copulation. <laughs> it's obvious, but it's very significant because very, very many of their contemporaries died without ha- or died young, died without having succeeded in reproducing. So we, we contain the genes that helped our ancestors to survive in the past. Uh, I've got a phrase which appears in the book and several of the others of my books, the genetic book of the dead. The genetic book of the dead is the genes in a modern animal which in a sense describe the past. There's a, the genes in, in an animal can be thought of as a kind of digital description of the worlds in which the ancestors of the past survived. Not the present and not the future. And as Mary Ellen has just pointed out, emergent properties mean that the future is going to be different. And in the case of human emergent properties, very, very different because we are changing our environment at breakneck pace, uh, much, much faster, I suppose, than any other animal has ever done. In a way, it's amazing that we do thrive so well in an environment which is radically different from the environment in which our genes survived in the past. We wear clothes. We live in huge cities. We get around in fast cars and fast planes and things like that. Um, We do suffer from psychological problems probably because the world in which we live now is so different from the one in which our biology was naturally selected. And this is all comes under the heading of emergent properties. So this this very beautiful passage, you know, the, the beginning that you that you've quoted here, where where you framed the very, very long geological time frame and then the cosmic time frame and then we have this person, you, observing both and then you're talking about this past that we are very well adapted for, but this emergent future to which we are hurtling, and we're creating it as we hurdle. Now, this rate of change, why has it increased? Has it increased? Have we been increasing it because of our increased numbers, or what's, what's yes. causing this? Uh, I mean, I, th- I think we, it, it, it is increasing. And if, if you think about the... Um, Well, if you you go back to the Stone Age, uh, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and so on, that's, you know, huge huge spans of time in between each of those major advances. Um, Agriculture, 10,000 years ago, 10,000 years or so. Um, Then the Industrial Revolution, the invention of printing. Um, Nowadays, we have the computer. We have computers... Moore's law, the exponential increase in the power of computers, the speed and economy, the speed and um, cheapness of computers. We're living in an astonishingly fast-changing world, uh, and it, it's no, showing no signs of slowing down. It's, it's still accelerating. So, so two questions kind of related to that. One is, it would seem that... Um, that it's the, that are, we are almost we're driven by our, our own invention of our own tools, the tools of perception in particular, starting with or referencing perhaps Galileo's t- telescope, but satellite technology, the microscope, 
um, the ability that we have to drill down ever, ever deeper to ever, ever more, you know, finely granulated um, discernments of, of what reality is. And then, you know, in this, in this way that becomes very social, like with the internet and Facebook and Twitter becoming ways that we actually organize ourselves socially, it would seem that our, our tool making is actually driving our social behavior in many ways. And I wonder what you think about that. It's not like we decided that our arts, that our culture, that our uh, understanding of history would be what determine us, but our, our tool making is really the thing, it would seem. Yes, and I, I think there's a kind of, um, it's, it's rather like what biologists call a, um, co-evolution. Um, ad advances make way for the next advance. Um, and in, in our case, I think we have in, in the world of computers, we have software-hardware co-evolution, where advances in hardware make possible software that wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been possible before the hardware was invented. And then so... Um, E each one paves the way, as it were, opens the door for the next advance, and, it, and that is getting faster. I have to say, it, it would seem that one thing we're sort of dispensing with kind of willy-nilly as we go is, is biology, the biologi biological reality of other species. Um, one of the things, th there seems a couple of thresholds that we've passed um, without really fully grokking what we've done. One is that the aggregate number of human beings on this earth has become a biogeophysical force, uh, discernible in the fossil record. The American Society for Geophysicists, or is the American, I, I never get it right, but they want to now call our epoch the Anthropocene to reflect this in profound impact of humans on on life on Earth. Now, one of the things that we're doing is we're reducing biodiversity of other species. Um, the way that some scientists put it is we're using up too much photosynthesis, so we're actually depriving other species of photosynthesis. But mostly it's really that we're taking away their habitat because we're, we're putting so many more human bodies on the Earth that we, we're converting their habitat to human buildings for people to live in and agriculture to feed people. Um, but, but we're doing something very scary to me, very dangerous and, and kind of tragic, which is reducing diversity itself. And I wonder if you could tell us about diversity in a very, you know, going back to the, the very profound and simple mechanism of, of natural selection and how it depends on diversity, how our life has depend, depended on diversity, and what are some of the how do you see the horizon as we take well, it out? I think it's more your subject than mine, actually, Mary Ellen. I mean, I, um, I, I, <laughs> um, uh, I, I mourn, as you do, the loss of diversity, and I, I mourn the extinction of species, um, if, if only at an aesthetic level. I mean, I think, I think it's... Um, uh, there, there have been mass extinctions before, and sometimes people say oh, well, the, the mass extinction, the so-called sixth extinction that, that, that humans are now causing, it, it's no worse than the previous ones, no worse than the one that wiped out the dinosaurs and things. Well, maybe not, but it's tragic. And I, um, I, I, I respond to it in, in an emotional, aesthetic way. I, I mourn the loss of thylacinus. I mourn the, um, the loss of the dodo, the passenger pigeon, um, but what you're talking about is something bigger than that, which is the, 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 the catastrophic loss of species. And ecologists tell us that uh, it, this is more than just the loss. They act, actually are, are ne species are actually necessary for the continuation of the balance of the, of the ecosystem. You know, I think it intersects pretty, pretty strongly with, with your expertise because, you know, you were talking about the, the genes that are this genetic book of life. Um, when I first started writing about evolution myself, and I was taught by um, evolutionary biologists, that some species, like an octopus, has conserved species, conserved genes in it that are so ancient because it Octopuses eventually, way back in time, evolved from ammonites from from different species that some in some cases no longer exist, but that those conserved genes that have persisted through the eons are very likely to be genes that are the most hardy and the most adaptable to future scenarios. 
So it's very important actually to conserve, especially species that have those ancient lineages um, because those conserved genes are, are perhaps more important than more recent genes. Well, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Um, that, that, that is interesting. It is, it, it is fascinating how some a- animals have, have conserved things for very, very long times and other, others haven't. There's enormous variance in the, in the, 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 in the, in the sheer age of, of genes, yes. Well, go, to go back to your own words, because um, it really is more important to stay in your world, although I think they over, over intersect quite much. Um, right in that introduction, you have a sentence that says, it's not un- an unreasonable speculation that the progressive growth of consciousness in the infant mirrors a similar progression over the longer time scale of evolution. Does a fish, say, have a rudimentary feeling of conscious personhood? Now, to connect that a little bit with another essay that you have somewhat later, which is a really fascinating essay about the internet, um, in which you, you wonder if, if um, here's, here's a sentence from it, the chapter's called Net Gain, and it's about how the internet may be changing the way we think. And here's your sentence, the unplanned worldwide unification that the web is achieving mirrors the evolution of the nervous system in multicellular animals. And then a little bit later you say the cloud is a superhuman interstellar traveler whose nervous system consists of units that communicate with each other by radio orders of magnitude faster than our puttering nerve impulses. But in what sense is the cloud to be seen as a single individual rather than a society? Yes, I mean, I should interject there that, that this cloud that you're talking about is, is from science fiction. Um, it's a, a science fiction book by Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle is, a, is or was a great astronomer and uh, he wrote a lot of science fiction, much of it not very good, but his first science fiction, (laughs) his first science fiction book is extremely good. It's called The Black Cloud. uh, And it's marred only by the obnoxious hero, which you can't help wondering, maybe modeled on the author. (laughs) (laughs) Because the the same obnoxious hero keeps turning up in in all Fred Hoyle's. Under a different name, it's supposed to be a different character, but he's always, always e- equally horrible. Anyway, um, uh, the Black Cloud is a, 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 a superhuman, mega, mega superhuman um, organism that appears, that, that comes towards the sun to, to feed on the energy of the sun. And eventually the human scientists on Earth get in touch with it and manage to communicate with it and learn about it. And it, um, different parts of the, of, the, of the cloud communicate with each other by radio. And the scientists raise the very interesting question, in what sense are you, the cloud, a single individual? And the cloud replies, well, it, the question doesn't mean very much. When the, when the rate of communication, the speed of communication between the, between the different communicators is very, very fast. You might as well stop talking about them as different individuals altogether. And if all of us could communicate telepathically with each other, instead of having to go through the slow bottleneck of speech, if we could all, as it were, communicate our thoughts directly by, at the speed of light, the speed of radio waves, then we would be one individual. It wouldn't mean anything to actually talk about ourselves as being separate individuals. And I think the point you're getting at is that the internet may be moving towards um, a sort of science fiction future where um, it becomes a single uh, being, a a single living organism of of some kind. And I think also another of the passages you read um, made an analogy with the um, the development of a child, where it's, it, it's been suggested that the consciousness of an individual child forms itself as a kind of melding of separate entities. The child starts off not as a single agent at all, but becomes a single agent through the same sort of melding as we've just been talking about. 
It's pretty. It's all pretty fascinating. It's it's as Charles Dickens said, the best of times and the worst of times. I mean, uh, looking at it both ways, it seems exciting. Yeah, that's what that's the way I feel. The <laughs> times and the worst of times. And then it's terrifying at the same time. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, just reading, I, I was re- rereading the Selfish Gene, which I read many years ago, and I was reading a very contemporary book called The Gene, um, which is just out in the last year, which is also very good. And I was, I was just remarking to myself how 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 timeless your book, The Selfish Gene, is. That the the profundity of of what you're explaining in that book hasn't changed that much in the decades since it was published. Well, thank you for that. That's, I'm glad about that. Well, in my <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> but a couple of things have changed. Um, and one is our ability to mess with the gene. So now humans can, we can alter the gene at the germ level. We take out, we can suppress the expression of certain genes. And we've also developed the ability to insert influences on genes. And I wondered if you would explain what CRISPR is uh, to the audience. Some of you probably know, but not everybody does. And, and tell us what you think about this, this moment in time when we've perhaps become the blind watchmaker ourselves. Yes. I, I, um, as it happens, I've read, I read coming on the plane coming over from England uh, a very interesting book on CRISPR by Jennifer Doudna, who lives in these parts. She's a professor at Ber- Berkeley. Um, Going on planes is a wonderful opportunity to read books, isn't it? You're, 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 you're separated. I, I read this entire book between London and New York. Reading an entire book, by the way, is more than Donald Trump has done in his whole adult life. Genetic manipulation, the, the actual... Um, uh, changing of genes is something that has been possible to do only relatively recently and uh, one of the main ways of doing it has been to transplant genes from one organism into another one and you've probably heard about cats that glow blue because they've had jellyfish genes put them in them and things like that CRISPR is a new technique which Jennifer Doudna was one of the main pioneers of and it's a wonderful book, I do recommend it, it's called crack in creation and it's kind of semi-autobiographical about her career um, but it's, it, it explains all about the, the technique of CRISPR and um, the misgivings that she has about its possible misuse and the power that it might, might have it is a very very powerful fast technique for changing, for actually writing, actually programming genes in organisms, any organism you like it comes from bacteria. Bacteria have their own immune system against viruses. Bacteria are very, very heavily afflicted by viruses called, um, um, what are they called? Um, phages, that's right. Bacter- <laughs> ba- ba- bacteria phages. Um, and um, the, and the technique that bacteria use in order to recognize viruses, in order, to, in order to, 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 to kill them, is a technique that humans can now exploit in order to edit genes of any organism you, you, you like. So it's an immensely powerful new technique and it's giving rise to great possibilities and also great misgivings. Whereas in the past, until for, the, for several, well, actually thousands of years, we have controlled evolution by manipulating the selection part of the Darwinian equation, the non-random survival, the non-random reproduction. We've controlled that to produce dogs that are wolves that have been changed into Pekingeses and poodles and bulldogs. And corn, the corn cobs changing from that size in the wild to huge great things, um, cabbages, things like kale, kohlrabi, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, all these things are modified versions of the wild cabbage, Brassica oleracea. That's been going on for hundreds of years, but now we can actually change the mutation part of the Darwinian equation, not only the selection part. And this is much faster, 
much more powerful, potentially very dangerous, and people are worried about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, re recommend the book, very good. This might sound like a very, it might be an oversimple question, but let's say someone messes with a gene in, in humans and creates some, some kind of human that is dangerous and from science fiction, could what would happen after that? Is, is it possible that, we, that something could be released that could never be? Well, I suppose it is. It, 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 I mean, the, the sort of ethical <coughs> um, discussion partly centers on the distinction. I, so I do croak a bit because I had a stroke a year and a half ago, and it's the one thing that's still there is, is, is my croaking voice. Um, <coughs> the, the distinction between uh, negative and positive manipulation um, it, it's already being used quite successfully and with rather little objection I think for removing uh, genetic disorders things like haemophilia Huntington's disease Duchenne muscular dystrophy things like that there are some people who even object on ethical grounds to doing that messing with nature meddling with nature playing God much more pe people object to positive manipulation trying to change the genes of a, of, a, of a human so that they become better at music, say, or mathematics, or, or high jump, or, or running, or something like that. A lot of people have objections to that. I think partly because it sort of smells a bit of Hitler, uh, trying to make sort of blonde, blue-eyed Aryans, um, what he called Aryans, um, I think that you do need to make an important distinction between uh, draconian, dictatorial, government-imposed genetic ch changing, like Hitler was doing, and voluntary. It's, it's, you can still object to people, the idea of people in, in the future going to a doctor and saying, Doctor, I want my child to be a brilliant musician. Please give her the right genes which may be possible, it's not possible yet. It would seem inevitable that we will do it. I mean, people Yes, I mean, I, I, are and, and the, 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 there are people who do, who do obje object to that. Man, many people object to that, actually. Um, and I can kind of see why. Although, if you sort of think a little bit laterally, we don't worry too much about parents who are ambitious to make their child into a brilliant musician and force the child to sit down at the piano for three hours a day. Uh, and work at it. Um, is that really all that much different than putting uh, a Bach gene into a child? <laughs> um, I think I'd rather have the gene than having to work at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but still, it, 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 pe people are, are, are worried about that and, and sort of nightmare visions of regiments of Saddam Hussein sort of marching all with the same genes, sort of brave new world, Aldous Huxley kind of world. As, as you said, Mary Ellen, the best of times and the worst of times, it, the, the future can look pretty scary sometimes. Well, we have some really fantastic questions from this incredibly literate audience. And I'll, um, since we're kind of on a technical topic, I will read this one. There, has been many, there have been many recent advances in abiogenesis, both in the area of potential RNA components and metabolism. What are your views in this area? Abiogenesis, we're talking here about um, the, 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 the beginnings of life, the, the creation of life from non-life, which has to have happened at least once. It has to have happened at the origin of life. It may have happened more than once. And um, it's one of the big mysteries that faces biology. We don't know how it happened. It happened about four billion years ago. And um, there have been various theories of how it might have happened. Uh, we know the kind of things it must have been. We know it was, it was the origin of the first self-replicating entity. In, in, in effect, the first gene. Once you've got the first gene, it needn't have been DNA, almost certainly wasn't DNA. Once you've got the first gene, the first self-replicating entity, then that's the prerequisite for Darwinian natural selection to get going. Once that started, then the whole story can take off and you get competition between genes, and then building cells to live in and then bodies 
of composed of lots of cells and so on. And, and once that started, then we kind of understand what happened. We know then Darwinism took off and gave rise to the full diversity and complexity of life. But how did that first step happen? It's a huge mystery. Um, it couldn't have been DNA, almost certainly couldn't have been DNA that started, because DNA is uh, what's been called a high-tech replicator. It's a very, very efficient replicator, but it needs a complicated infrastructure of protein in order to do its replication. And you can't have a complicated infrastructure of protein unless you've got DNA. So we have a CAT22, it's been called the CAT22 of the origin of life. RNA is uh, a related molecule to DNA, as many of you no doubt know. Um, and RNA has a kind of weakened re replication pro property. It, it, it is a replicator, it's not as good a replicator as DNA. And it also has the capacity to be an enzyme like protein. So RNA could have done both jobs. You remember I talked about the catch-22 of the, the origin of life, where you can't have DNA unless you've got protein, you can't have protein unless you've got DNA. If you've got RNA, it can do both jobs. It can do the job of DNA and the job of protein. So the sort of current most fashionable theory of abiogenesis at the moment is that it was RNA that first started things off. And then the replication function was taken over by DNA, and the enzyme function was taken over by, uh, by protein. I'm going to aggregate a few questions that have to do with uh, machine, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, one is, how do humans adapt to the co-evolution of machines and their inevitable evolution to learn? Is, is there a point that we must unplug? Um, I guess that's kind of a question about worrying, as another one of the questions does about artificial intelligence. That there's a, um, another question references Elon Musk's um, anxieties about a possible threat from artificial intelligence. Yes. Um Elon Musk is worried about it, and you, can't, you, and you must listen to Elon Musk. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's Elon Musk is a genius, and, and there's no doubt about it. Um, so is Stephen Hawking, and he worries about it as well. Um, I am, I suppose, as a philosophical naturalist, I'm committed to the view that uh, there's nothing in the brain, nothing in, in our bodies, nothing in our brains that isn't physics. I'm committed, so therefore, to the view that anything that our brains can do, potentially, can be uh, simulated, can be done also by machines. So I, I think it is definitely possible that machines will do everything we can do, and likely that they'll do it better. So um, it may not ca happen for a long time, uh, but in principle it's possible. And um, various people, including Elon Musk, are worried about, about it. Some people are worried about our not being necessary anymore. All our jobs are going to be taken over by um, robots. And uh, maybe we'll be dispensed with altogether if they, if they get to the point where they can make their own children, make new, new robots, and they don't, won't even need us at all. Um, and so we, we go extinct and our creations take over. Maybe they'll do a better job than we do. I don't know why would we, we would be so particularly worried about that, really. He, well, <laughs> I'd, be, I, I'd be worried in exactly the same way as I'm worried about losing the rhinoceros and, and the elephant. And, and it, it's, it's an aesthetic thing for, for me. Um, <laughs> I, th I think... Um, <laughs> I would, I would be sorry if uh, Shakespeare and Mozart and Schubert and Michelangelo were forgotten and um, nobody knew about them. But of course there's no reason why the robots shouldn't not, not only know about Shakespeare but actually appreciate him. Um, 
Because remember, we're talking about robots that can do everything that humans can do. Fall in love, um, be, be wowed by great poetry and great music, and maybe write better poetry and better music. You never know. So, best of times, worst of times, yet again. It's scary, terrifying, but at the same time, exhilarating. Well, we've got a number of different questions here about religion, so I'll try to, what to aggregate them a little bit. <laughs> um, so when are liberals afraid of Islam, if you could ask believers one question to most shake their beliefs, what would that question be? Um, I have a question about um, a statement that you make in one of your essays that says, we'll understand rel religious behavior only after we have renamed it. And um, in that essay, you're... Sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry. You say, we'll understand religious behavior only after we have renamed it. So when we have understood what, what religious behavior has been good for or why it evolved, and then we don't have to call it religion anymore, we can just um, understand that it, it served a purpose or perhaps still does. Yes. I think what you're talking about there is when I was, uh, when I was talking about the evolutionary advantages of religion, where, which in, in, in a sense there has to be, uh, uh, we, we, we are challenged to produce and answer the question, what is the Darwinian survival value of religion? And the reason that we're challenged to do that is that religion is extremely widespread, it's, it's ubiquitous in human cultures, that all human cultures I think have something equivalent to religion, and so it suggests it really is a, 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 a human universal and therefore probably does need some kind of explanation. And I, what I said was, which is what, what, what you're quoting there, what I said was that we have to uh, rename the question before we, can, before we can answer it. It may be that it's the wrong question to say what is the survival value of religion. It may be that the right question is what is the survival value of some psychological predisposition which manifests itself as religion under the right circumstances. So that's the, what I mean by the renaming. Um, we're redescribing the problem. It's no longer the, the question, what's the survival value of religion? It's what's the survival value of a psychological predisposition, which might be things like a tendency to obey authority, a tendency to believe what your elders and betters tell you, um, a, a tendency to be scared of dying, something, let's say, a, a combination of psychological predispositions which manifest themselves as, um, as religion, rather than ask the question, what's the survival value of religion? I think that's what I was meaning there. But what was the question that, that the, the card said before you, because I didn't really hear that. Here's, here's one, uh, there's a couple of them. Humans are getting rid of religion and replacing it with new age woo rather than skepticism. How do we get rid of this danger, dangerous emerging trend? Um, another person wondering what your thoughts on the future of religion and governments are in the age of artificial intelligence and never dying superhumans. Um, and I think if you yeah, were okay. going to, to, to puncture someone, a believer's belief, how would you do it? What would be your, your main way to do that? Right, okay. Well, to take the last one first, um, puncture. Um, read the Bible. <laughs> um, what was the earlier one? <laughs> Are liberals afraid of Islam? Sorry? Are liberals afraid of Islam? Are liberals afraid of Islam? Uh, yes, I mean, you, you, I think the questioner there may, may be referring to the tendency for uh, the sort of nice people, our people, my kind of people, to abandon their principles when talking about the, the horrors of... Um, homophobia and uh, misogyny and things like that. All these things which we all hold dear. I mean, we, 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 we hate misogyny, we hate homophobia. But when it comes to Islam, if there are many people in this country and in Britain who forget all about that and say, oh, well, if it, oh, oh no, we don't criticize that because that's religion. Um, 
That's, their, that's part of their culture. What a patronizing, condescending thing to say. Um, Majid Nawaz, who is an ex-Muslim, ex-almost Muslim terrorist, act actually, who now runs a, a magnificent foundation called the Quilliam Foundation to try to reform Islam. Um, he coined the phrase regressive left um, for this tendency to, um, as it were, give Islam a free pass when you talk about your principles about um, feminism and about um, uh, homophobia and, and things like that. Um, I think that, it's, that this regressive left tendency in, the, in liberals stems from partly from a terror of being thought racist because they mistakenly think that Islam is a race, which of course it isn't. Um, well, you laugh, but it's very, very widespread. Um, uh, if you can convert into it or apostatize out of it, it's not a race. <laughs> so that's, I, I think that's, that, that, that's part of it. I think also it's a, it's a laudable tendency to identify with victims of oppression. And we all do that, at least I hope we do. Uh, and, but I think that they have identified the wrong victims. They think that Muslims are victims of oppression from the West. Actually, Muslims are the victims of oppression from Islam, especially Muslim women, Muslim gays, uh, ex-Muslims, um, apostates. Um, that, that's the real victimization. That, that's the real problem. Um, and so I think we need to, to well, Majid Nawaz is trying to reform Islam from, from within, and, and that's a very good thing to try to do. Um, Ayan Hirsi Ali is trying to do the same thing. We in the liberal community in the West need to reform our view of who is the victim here and who is doing the victimizing. So we, we do have a big problem with, um, with this idea of, of trying to reform religions that are oppressive to people's human rights. And yet saying that we should reform them is only talking to people who already agree that we should not be oppressing other people's human rights. What, do we need to replace religion with some other kind of code of behavior? What, what, what could be effective in changing the way that people aggregate their communities around values? I mean, people that will criticize your position on religion say you're not getting the whole thing about religion because religion is, because science does not explain everything. And there are, um, there are beliefs that people have that are spontaneous and continuous over generations through history, through literature, through art, through music. Uh, many of the finest um, expressions of human creativity have been what we would call religious. Um, so we can't just get rid of religion. Well, no, there's a, there's a lot there. And, and I mean, there's, there's, you say, science can't explain every, every, everything. Um, science can explain everything about the real world. So, so, <laughs> uh, Point taken. <laughs> Um, now, I mean, art and music and, um, and, and morality, they're, they're, they're a di different matter. Um, science can't tell you what's right and wrong, probably, although Sam Harris might d disagree there. Um, but science certainly can help you enormously in thinking clearly about what to do about what's, what's right and wrong. You can identify logical inconsistencies in your moral position using scientific reasoning and moral philosophical reasoning which is a kind of application of the scientific method of thinking to moral questions now things like you mentioned art and music yes i mean many many great works of art great works of music are inspired by religion um, it's a great mistake, of course, to think that that makes religion in any way valid or true or anything like that. It's nothing, to, nothing, to, nothing of the sort. Um, it, it's entirely natural 
partly that great music and great art should have been inspired by religion because in past centuries that's where the money was and artists and musicians uh, are sponsored by rich benefactors. Um, I mean, Bach was employed as a, as a church Kapellmeister, for example. Michelangelo was employed to paint the Sistine Chapel. Um, but also, religion, of course, does provide, did, or has, always has provided, genuine inspiration. I mean, this is the story of Jesus' passion, Jesus' crucifixion, is a, is a tragic story which, not, not surprisingly, inspired great artists and great musicians. Um, and we, we don't, we shall never know what might have, if, if science, if say Haydn had written his evolution oratorio instead of his creation oratorio, <laughs> uh, or Beethoven's Mesozoic symphony, uh, <laughs> you, ha you ask what, what, what do we replace religion by? Well, um, for all sorts of different purposes. For, for morality, we replace it by moral philosophy. Um, for, for music and so on, I, I, I suggest, you know, my, slightly facetiously, that, that, that science and indeed reality um, could provide inspiration, perhaps every bit as beautiful as, or just nature, um, provides beautiful inspiration for, 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 for art. Um, community, religion has provided community. Well, we can do that in different ways. We don't need religion in order to provide um, a sense of community, a sense of, of oneness. So what do you think is going on here? Why, why um, do we have Donald Trump as our president? <laughs> Scientifically speaking. <laughs> well, I mean, partly because you have this dopey electoral college system. <laughs> which, which, by the way, is not quite so difficult to get rid of as, as, as people often think. Um, on paper, it's very, very difficult to get rid of because you need... Um, a two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress, I think, and then, and then um, it needs to be ratified by a substantial number of state legislatures. So just simply to abolish the Electoral College at one stroke is a very difficult thing to do. But the Constitution does allow each state to change the way it chooses its delegates to the Electoral College. Now, um, Maine and Nebraska, as you know, do it in a pro rata way, but they're very small, and so it doesn't make much difference. If California were to suddenly do what Nebraska and Maine do, it would be a disaster, because, um, I mean, it, uh, so you, 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 you can't do that. What you can do, what you, what you could do, is for individual states in their own way decide that they will follow the Constitution and um, send all their Electoral College uh, delegates one, one way or the, or the other. But California, for example, could decide that all its Electoral College delegates will vote in the Electoral College the way the entire country votes. So they would look at the, at the, at the popular vote in the entire country and say, right, they're all going to vote that, that way. And that can be done on a state-by-state -state basis. It's not, it wouldn't be a drastic, sudden change in the way that suddenly going over to the Nebraska main system uh, would, would be. Uh, it, you don't have to wait until a substantial number of states agree to do it, which is, which is there, there, there is this move, movement afoot, as you, as you may know, waiting for a certain number of states to agree to do it. I don't think you need wait for that. Because individual states can do it, and it won't make much difference to begin with. But it would get rid of the anomaly that you have at present. I think the Electoral College, when it first started, was probably rather a good idea. And if you could have a true Electoral College, where instead of the 
Electoral College members being pledged to vote for particular candidates. That's when the rot set in. If the Electoral College was a gr group of people elected to go to Washington, sit down together, and deliberate on who would make the best president, rather like we do when we choose a new professor or a new <laughs> chancellor of the university or something, um, take up references, read their books, read their... <laughs> Um, <laughs> Since we do have um, Donald Trump as our president. In interview them. Um, <laughs> so that, that's the Electoral College. Why, why have we got Donald Trump? Well, I recommend Michael Moore's analysis. Have, have some of you seen his... his, his um, I mean, he, he was one of the few people who got, got the prediction right. And um, he's t sort of talking about Rust Belt uh, people feeling inferior, feeling left behind, feeling that their, their world is disappearing and they need defending and things like that. So if you haven't seen his, his, his an, an analysis, it's well worth looking at. So to, to tie, um, to, to tack us back to more scientific questions perhaps, and since we do have Donald Trump as president, I think this, this question might wrap it up well. If uh, a catastrophic event <laughs> resulted in the death of most humans and rendered all electronics useless, how long would it take for humans to evolve to survive in the wild without technology. And then a related question from another um, person asking, can humans, do you think humans will ever evolve to the point of speciating so that we uh, actually become split off into more than one species? Yes. Um, well, speciation um, requires that there should be some separation so that there's no gene flow between the incipient species. And normally this happens by a geographical accident. Time, okay. Um, normally, this happens through a geographical accident where um, a population gets split. Perhaps part of the population finds itself on an, on an island, uh, and so there is no gene flow between them, and so they are free to evolve in different directions. Uh, and that is not going to happen on, on this planet now. I mean, <laughs> Isn't the opposite kind of happening, where we are, we are becoming so much of flowing into each other exactly, that we're yeah. actually... Yeah, exactly. So the, the only chance for humans to speciate would probably be if, if a colony was set up on Mars or something where, um, and there was a little gene flow between, between them. So that, that was that question. And the other, I keep forgetting what the uh, what, if you give them well, two questions of time. Since we only have time for one last question, I think that I'd like to ask you what you would like to tell us if there's something that you didn't come up tonight. I mean, you are a person to whom we are, are looking very um, earnestly for guidance and helping us to synthesize things that very often really feel very separate. Our moral values, our knowledge of science, our technologies, our, our past, our comprehension of our, our place in the universe. And um, what would you like us to understand? What, what do you feel like most of us are not getting? Right. Um, I think um, evidence is the only reason to believe that anything is true. Uh, so personal opinions, feelings, emotions are fine and we all have them, but they do not tell you what's true, and they, don't, and they should not guide important decisions like who you vote for and what, what you do, what policy decisions that you, that you take. Evidence is the only um, reason to believe anything. That's as far as uh, believing things is, is concerned. Where morality is concerned, ethics is concerned, that needs to be intelligently designed. Don't base your morality, don't base your politics, don't base your ethics on holy books or tradition or revelation or authority. Base it on intelligent design, sitting down together and trying to design the kind of society you want to live in. Um, yeah. Okay, that's it. That's it. <laughs>
So I hope you have enjoyed this evening's program brought to you by the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Club of Silicon Valley. We would like to thank Richard Dawkins, author of Science in the Soul, Selected Writings of a Passionate Rationalist, our audience here in Santa Clara, and those of you joining us on the radio and the web. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. <laughs> Isn't that fun? So Richard Dawkins will be signing books. We'd like you to sign up to have that occur over here on the left. Because of the number of people here tonight, uh, there's no personalization, just, just the autograph, and no selfies. 